well, I'm a big fan of old slipwear, um, which I find really charming more than anything, actually. And I like the idea of using clay that isn't uh, precious, I think is the word that I would use. I kind of like its raw edges. I like the feel of terracotta. I love it when you fire it super high and it goes a really beautiful, rich, sort of dark brown. And then you've, you've got this, it's very difficult to add color onto that surface. So I started sort of introducing, basically it's slip. Hi, I'm Bob Acton, and welcome to the Color and Ceramics podcast. Today, we're lucky to have Mish Falano on the show. She's an outstanding potter in the United Kingdom who does beautiful work with slips and color and images on terracotta clay. We talked about her journey in clay, her surface design methods, how she engages her spirit in her work, and some advice she has for potters. You'll find links to her website and social media in the show notes. So let's get to the interview. Welcome to Color in Ceramics, the podcast for ceramic artists who want valuable ideas about using color from leading artists and world-class experts. Here's your host, Bob Acton, a sculptor and ceramic artist who's fascinated with color and how potters, sculptors, and artists use color in their work. Tune in as he talks with his guests about color, techniques, and the impact of color on people and art itself. Well, Mish, thank you for joining me today, and welcome to the Color and Ceramics podcast to talk about color and surface design. I really love your work. I I love the beautiful ceramic pieces that you have with the sketching that you, the colorful sketching that you have on it and, Ooh. and that, and the white slip, I assume it's white slip that you it have is. on the uh, dark, <laughs> on the dark clay. Cause I think that really makes things pop. Um, and so, uh, so welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the beauty we see and feel when we approach your pieces really represents years of hard work. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming the artist you are today. It's rather a long journey that's been broken up into, you know, a fair few pieces, but it kind of started at school. So back in the early 80s, um, I left school and because there were no jobs, I decided that I would take on um, a college course. Um, where I fell in love with clay more than anything. And that took me on to a foundation course, which then took me on to do a degree. Um, And I did my degree in woods, metals, ceramics and plastics Mm -hmm. in Brighton, UK. Um, But that got sort of stopped short after two years because funding changed in the UK. So a lot of people couldn't actually finish their degrees. Um, which and I was one of them, but I still knew that that was something I was definitely going to pursue at some point in my life. Um, well, to fast forward a few years, I took a job working in a graphics department for a small company, which when everything was very analog, there was no computers. It was all daisy wheel printers and bromide cameras and was very hands on. That suited me really well. Um, but unfortunately, after about six years working there, the the owner was tragically killed. So I kind of lost my job there. And, and then I went to work for another company called XArt, which we had this sort of mobile phone revolution happening. And I was employed by, they were a subsidiary of Nokia. And so my graphics got very grounded at that point. And I was working for all the Premier League football clubs, designing their mobile phone faces. I'm sure you remember the old 3210s and 7110s where you clipped the fronts and backs onto phones. Well, a lot of those I was responsible for. (laughs) And I hold my hands up. (laughs) So um, I got involved with graphics in quite a big way, actually. And I really enjoyed doing it, although it was very two-dimensional. It was something that, I think my love of print and my love of colour, because obviously, especially with Premier League clubs and 
Formula One racing and not particularly the things that I was interested in, but I did like playing around with all the text and the badges and the, it was like you're collaging constantly on two dimensions, mm -hmm. which I sort of loved. And then in 2008, I had the opportunity to go back to college and leave work. And so I found a course where I could rekindle my love in clay, really. Um, and I found a part-time course that was doing a foundation degree. I went along there to get like a portfolio together and to, to sort of re, reinvest myself into that material. But in the background, there was all this stuff that I'd learned from graphics and input, you know, was just going in and it was sort of coming out on the clay badly at that time, I'll, I'll add. But it was... It was going in and out again, and it was like, okay, this is this is something that I hadn't really considered, um, but I really enjoyed trying to find ways of surfacing things which had multiple layers, different colour combinations, and also print, which was, I really wanted to keep within the work. So um, I finished that two years, and I went to St Martin's to finish my degree in central London. Again, learned an awful lot at Central St. Martin's. Fantastic course. Came out of there, hit the road, you know, decided that's it. I'm I'm brilliant now. I must be brilliant. <laughs> I'm just going to be able to do this forever. But you kind of then lose the ability to use the facilities, which I hadn't really considered. Mm -hmm. So where I was going in and making up screens to do print with, all of a sudden I didn't have a screen printing option. So I started to sort of experiment with other ways of working on a surface in an analog kind of way, um, which then took me onto a master's because I felt that I hadn't learned everything I needed to learn. So I went to the Royal College in 2014 um, graduated in 2016 um, and I spent most of my two years there experimenting with print um, and surface um, so that's sort of how I've come to this point so after I left there had a really good degree show got some great opportunities sort of continue with those opportunities and it just snowballs from there on and I'm still even now experimenting with colour and print and each week I try other things so I'm always looking for ways to have that immediacy of working in a very immediate way so a little bit like when you're doing a, a two-dimensional collage you you kind of pull things from different places and add and take away it was very much like that so that's where my work really sits and that's the bit I enjoy the most really so yeah. that's sort of how I am where I am now very cool thanks so much for sharing that you know when I look at your work your your clay mm. work uh mm. it really seems to be uh kind of a as I mentioned <coughs> earlier kind of a juxtaposition mm. between this dark clay that you work mm. with and then this smooth brightly colored uh, slips and colors and stuff. Can yeah. you tell us a bit more about that process? Like, how did you come up with that? What do you, what do, you do with that? Well, I'm a big fan of old slipwear, um, which I find really charming more than anything, actually. And I like the idea of using clay that isn't uh, precious, I think is the word that I would use. I kind of like its raw edges. I like the feel of terracotta. I love it when you fire it super high and it goes a really beautiful rich sort of dark brown and then you've you've got this it's very difficult to add color onto that surface so i started sort of introducing basically it's slip you know introducing slip onto terracotta and then coloring those slips creates this really vibrant i think a sort of uh, juxtaposition i think of, of this very matte, dirty surface with a super shiny glazed surface. For me, just just always, it reminds me of old buildings and when you're walking past the window, it goes from, you know, dirty brick, especially in London, 
dirty brick into glass, into dirty brick into glass. And that sort of penetrates, I think, when you're living, I don't live in the city, but I spend quite a lot of time there. So you kind of can't help that just filters in. Mm-hmm. So for me, having that complete uh, opposite is is quite exciting yeah, for can, me. Yeah, I can see yeah. why. How, how do you balance the use of color uh, with the other elements of design, like form and texture and so on? In your piece? I don't tend to use much texture. I allow the clay to provide its own texture. So I'll use a Sometimes I'll use a very groggy clay and sometimes use a smooth clay. I think it just depends on where I'm at at the moment. I'll sort of, you know, I'll, I'll switch between different clays. Um, the colour is more about what I've seen. Uh, I'm a bit of a sort of flaneur in that way and I'll sort of walk around streets wandering aimlessly and allow it to soak in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I sort of come back and I avid sketchbooker. I'm constantly drawing and painting in my sketchbook and sketching in my sketchbook. And so what I'll tend to do is I I cut out a little window in a piece of card and I kind of move it around the sketches that I've done and I'll sort of see different colours and it becomes more abstract. And so it's rather than it being a a drawing of something in particular, it becomes a, a section of that drawing, which I then kind of recreate onto the surfaces using those colors really I, I'm quite I, I will take a little bit of artistic license and change things around a little bit ultimately I, I will like the way the colors are positioned or the way that the um, the composition is working and then I transfer that it's quite difficult onto 3d because you're constantly moving the vessel around to sort of make sure it works on all those angles. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, yeah, it does. And and I, I think when I've seen your work, it's a two dimensional photograph, so we're only seeing a portion of it. Are your okay. colors all the way around the piece, or yes. just on one? Okay, yeah. yeah, they're all the way around. That's a very interesting thing. I was th- as you were talking about cutting out uh, a hole out of a, a piece of paper. That makes mm. me think of landscape artists who may pull that kind of a process up in the landscape to find that piece that they want to paint yeah and and i I... think it does make it quite abstract Mm -hmm. in that sense so it's very difficult to explain you know if i've I've been to i don't know york or somewhere and someone says why is this york (laughs) you know and i'm sort of well ah that's a good question because and then when i go through the process and tell them the process they oh i get it you know and they can see maybe the colors the colors will reflect what I've seen in that city or yeah. a certain part of the city. Absolutely. So you've taken mm. a piece of your sketch of the place and that, be- that becomes the uh, sketch, as I might say it, uh, yeah. on, on the work itself. Absolutely. Uh, so, so you use some really bright colors, which I, of course, I love those. But I mm. wonder if you could tell us about any challenges that you faced in working with color in ceramics like how, and how you overcame those challenges. Uh, a, lo- a lot of the time I'm looking for, well, it depends. I think colour can be sort of two things. The first is there's a very flat colour, almost like a gouache, where there's, you know, or a, if you're working in paint, it's a very flat, one solid colour, which can have, you know, underglazes will work like that. Mm. Um, but for me, that sometimes is not enough. So... And I've just actually finished a piece that's um, in greens, which I find very difficult to work with green. Um, and yet there's a, probably about six different greens that make up the block of the colour. Um, that took me a long time to break out of just this flat colour. So that was about finding, you know, um, what I might do is I'll start with a base slip green and, um, And then I learned quite quickly that you've got to be careful how much stain you add to slips because I sometimes, well, early on, I was getting a lot of bubbling and a lot of crawling and because I was just overloading it so much. But I I think over time you you learn to understand your palette um, and understand how to mix those palettes. 
So some I know that I can only add up to 5% of something, whereas some another colour I might be able to add 15%. So you kind of learn those things as you go along. And it is about experimenting. I do a lot of experimenting. Um, and the same when it comes to drawing over the top of those as well. So I may get all the flat, you know, the flat colours, if I call them that, the big block colours. Yeah. And then I'll put subtle colour on top. And some of those subtle colours don't like other colours. And that's just, you know, one of those things you learn and it destroys you a little bit, especially if you really like the piece and it comes off and it's crawled off or it's peeled off. But you kind of work around it, you know, all those, every time you have a, a problem, you can sort of work around it um, by starting off from where you were before and then adapting what you've done. So there is a lot of testing. There are a lot of sometimes some mistakes because you can get a bit overzealous when you're working in such a fluid way. You kind of forget that that didn't work with that last time. So, yep. you know, it, I do have some howlers. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of practice though, isn't it? And sure. I and and I think that, you know, we I listen to uh, people in other worlds like musicians and so on who you know advise people to practice deliberately and to mm. practice deeply i was thinking of anna vidovich who's a classical uh, guitar player and she said that we have to work on our technique all our life and mm. you know and given that you're at the top of your artistic game uh, how, how do you practice your, we've kind of been pitching on that a little bit. How do you practice color and surface design? What I tend to do is whenever I put a kiln load on, I will always take some of the palette that I've got and then I will meticulously paint them over the top of each other in different ways. I might paint an orange over a green or a green over an orange and I'll mark what I've done. You know, I'll mark those those test tiles, if you like. Mm. And I fire them at the, in exactly the same way as the work that I'm firing at that time. So every time I fire something, I've always got something in there that I'm testing. Mm. So I'm, for example, um, I've made up a printing ink that is a, is a little bit risque because it's made with oil. Um, and I, I, you know, that could, that could throw everything out. Um, so I'm sort of a bit careful now. So I did a, I did a lot of tests with, in, on different things, printed onto slip, printed onto underglaze, printed onto stains, printed onto pretty much every permutation that I use to create those colors and then glaze them all. And you sort of very quickly learn which you can do that with. So, you know, I can't, for example, print onto the top of a very highly stained slip because for some reason the oil base of the ink doesn't like the thick slip underneath and it will go a very mucky greeny sort of nasty color um, but it won't you know it, and it will also blister the glaze so you kind of each time I've introduced something new I will test it methodically um a, which i think a lot of professional potters do as a matter of course anyway um because you spend a lot of time making objects and the last thing you want to do is just chance it you know and throw it in the bin when it comes out the kiln because that's happened a lot <laughs> uh, yeah me too me too in fact that was one of the things that stimulated my desire to do this podcast was because right. often we make the form and then we've got to apply the finish to it and that mm. can create lots of uh, stress and anxiety uh, about the whole thing and you know one of the things that crossed my mind as i was listening to you was how our our customers or our audience often doesn't understand because they yeah. don't see it all of the hours and the heartache that goes into testing and trying and and mm. all, all of those things that you're talking about oh they know that's one of the questions if i'm doing a show um you know a public show then that is that is probably one of the things that people ask me the most how do you do that um and it isn't so much as that it's not just one thing, you know, there's probably seven or eight different yes. processes involved. Yeah. 
in creating this surface. So, you know, you can you can go online and you can find potters that love showing how they do stuff and they're not camera shy and they're quite happy to, um, you know, tell you what they do. And I think all potters are very generous um, with their, the, you know, how they do things because I remember as a student, I would be asking those questions as I was going around the show. So most potters have been in that position and it's not just an art form, it's a science as well. So that science side crops up quite a lot. And that's the bit when it's all very well if you're working in 2D with paper and pencils, you can easily rub things out and scribble them off. But when you're working in three dimensions and it's having to go through like volcanic temperatures, there's a lot of science there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No <laughs> um, kidding. And you, you start explaining to people that buy your work, and they do are very appreciative of you giving the information. They're, you know, very, I tend to find that most people that talk to me really want to know. It's not, it's not sort of lip service. They really are interested in how you do stuff. And I think the more complicated things are, the more interested they are too. Mm -hmm. So I'm always forthcoming about how I do things. Cool. You know, you've mm -hmm. talked about you learning, particularly around the chemistry and science of mm -hmm. uh, clay mm -hmm. and ceramics. I wonder if there are any specific artists either in the ceramics world or other artistic disciplines, whose use of color has really had a profound impact on your work uh, that they've uh, One artist in particular that I really admired, uh, you know, when I first started using color was, I don't know if you've heard of Laura Mabry. Mm -hmm. She's an American artist. I have, uh, sure. And I've watched her sort of career uh, and her new, you know, as her work evolves. And I do sit in awe of her work because she's also, you know, not just block colour now, everything, the colour's moving. Um, you know, some of the work that she produces now are like sculptural pieces where the clay is actually the sculpture and the, the glaze becomes this part of this great sculpture. So I do, I do look at her work and also the scale of her work sometimes can be really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to work on that scale. I just don't have the room to work on that scale. Um, you know, you, everyone's sort of a bit bound by what space they've got. Sure. You know, I'm bound by what kilns I've got. So I can only work to a certain scale. Um, but her work in particular has really kind of, really has profoundly affected me. But the other person as well is Picasso, bizarrely. Picasso's ceramic work um is outstanding uh i was really fortunate when i was at the rca to have i think it was christie's the auction house uh came to the rca and wanted to photograph the work of picasso that they'd got for auction in our studios mm. and so i was really fortunate to be able to see these things and handle them you know close up and they are so simple and beautiful and the line making and the mark making is spectacular um and probably some of the most simplest things that I've ever seen but the most effective so sometimes I do feel like I just want to do one line and that's it mm -hmm. um and that is something that I I'm sort of I'm getting better at now pulling back a little bit um, because I can sometimes be a bit too exuberant and I, I do do, you know, I do know that. Yeah. It sounds like you're saying doing less is sometimes more. I think the quality of the line is super important. Um, you know, it's, it's about that expression that you get in just one brush mark or two brush marks, uh, a bit like Cy Twombly as well, his color palette amazing paintings so I think I'm probably more inspired by painters mm. um and you know some of the St Ives group um I particularly like some of their landscape work and Patrick Heron um so I think most of the work that I really admire their use of color 
was probably the abstract expressionist period where they they were using block color but somehow the line quality was exceptional for me it was yeah. it was uh, exceptional yeah yeah that really makes it pop doesn't it the uh, mm. you know you can have that as you call it that flat color surface but the the yeah. line that you might put in the piece uh, really uh, draws the eye to it. it it does and again when you're working with clay it's much more difficult to create those lines mm -hmm. uh, so you kind of find you end up with certain tools that you've found or you've worked with for example I use a porcupine quill quite a lot to draw those lines because it's slightly bendy and I tend to do I'm right-handed but I tend to make the marks with my left hand so I'm a little bit more out of control and the lines create themselves then so I'm not controlling it you know um which can be really really interesting when that happens um you you do get some marks that you go I could never have done that because I think the pressure's too much when you're trying to create this certain line. So if you take the pressure away, close your eyes or do it with your left hand, you always get something much more exciting. Yeah, That's for sure. Important. For sure. Yeah. I agree completely. I was thinking about yeah. in my world, sometimes if I'm using my right hand, I'll get what I call tight and I, mm -hmm. I don't want to be tight. So that I really relate to what you're, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. And I do that quite a lot, actually. Um, actually, I'd say more so because I can draw very, you know, normally like an artist can draw, but I don't particularly like those drawings. The ones I like the most are my sketches, the ones that ha I haven't had that precious moment with. They're they're very loose, they're very free, um, and they're more me. I think yeah. they're that subconscious side of you that just comes out when you're not really looking or concentrating. They're the ones I like the most. Yeah, very cool. The spirit comes out in that way. Uh-huh. I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Hey, you know what I was thinking, but we've talked a lot here today already about um uh your technique and how you do things and how you approach your work. And I I wonder what advice you might have for a, a young ceramic artist or or maybe an older one who's starting out. But some, some what advice have you got for a budding ceramic artist? We'll call it that who's just starting to develop their own unique style? I think <clears throat> one of my tutors once said to me that it was important that I was having fun. And I never really thought about that very much until I started making for myself properly, for myself as an artist. And you have to have fun while you're doing it because I think it becomes a job otherwise. And I don't really want a job. If that, <laughs> I don't know what that makes me sound like, but. No, I know exactly I what love, you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of love doing what I'm doing and the freedom of doing it. And it, I, mean, I mean, from a psychological point of view, when I come into my studio and I shut the door and I switch on the heater and I put my radio on, I'm in my own space. I mean, my head, goes into you know the space I need it to go in it just does and the worrying side of my brain and the daily side of my brain just switches off and then and then the other side of my brain I think just switches on and concentrates on what I'm doing and so I don't get bogged down by everyday stuff um so if you're a, a ceramicist or you a wannabe ceramicist or just a, a hobby potter or you know, working with clay, I think there's an innate knowledge that happens when you pick up clay. It just is there. It's born with you. you there's a sense that you get when you work with it. Um, and it unlocks a part of your brain and it gives your other side of the brain a rest. So any potter that's out there thinking it's not for me, even if they just play with a ball of clay, I think that's beneficial to their mental state as well. I just think it's the best thing for them to do, keep picking up the clay, keep making, and allowing yourself to keep making and allowing yourself to keep making mistakes because you will find what it is you're looking for at some point. And it's great fun when you do. It's yeah. like revelationary. Yeah. And so, it, 
it's really a balance, I think, between knowing the technical side enough so that it works. Like you're talking about what temperature do I put it at and, and what, how much stain do I put in the slip? Mm. I'll call that kind of the technical piece. Um, uh, with this freedom yeah. that you're talking about, this, uh, this, this joy, this sense of allowing the spirit mm. to come out, and it's about allowing both to happen at the same time, ultimately. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think so. You, uh, when I've done run classes in the past, I have people from all walks of life in their classes. And, you know, from nurses to teachers to well, pretty much any retired right across the board. I mean, I've, I've got a young 18 year old um, and they sort of come to you with their daily troubles. And by the time they've left three hours later, you can see that spirit has been allowed to come alive in the classroom. And they will sit and make, and some will sit very quietly and they're happy in their little making zone and others create this, they've got an aura about them where it's excitement. And as a tutor, that is something that really excites me. And they come to me for the technical advice. So the, the technical advice can be learned by books. And, you, you know, I think everybody can learn that technical side um me personally I was the pain in the backside for all the technicians at the universities because I just followed them around like what are you doing how are you loading that can what temperature is that you know and I think I drove them a little bit nuts to be fair but all that knowledge goes in and now I'm giving that knowledge out to the students yeah. so you can learn it out of a book but not it's, it's much better when you practice practice it I think very cool. And learn by those mistakes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, uh, you know, we'll put a notification of your website and so on up in the podcast. Uh, but mm -hmm. I guess uh, given what you just said, some people might say, hey, does she teach? And um, and can <laughs> I go and take classes with her? So that's my question. Do you teach? Can people come and take classes with you? I did up until about two years ago. I was running classes through my studio and um, I was keeping people sane during COVID when we were allowed to mingle. So I basically opened up the class for three at a time um, so that they could socially distance and for their mental health a lot more than anything. Um, and I taught those for quite some time. Um, and I gave them, basically, I had to stop the teaching about, I think, just over a year ago now because I got too busy and... I was, you know, um, running out of kiln space, not getting any of my work done. And so it became uh, a, a point where I, I was at a balancing point and I was like, my work's being affected now. So I have to like put that on hold. So, I mean, I'm doing a, a talk, demonstration talk in about three weeks time where I do demonstrate some of the processes that I use and talk about my work. And that's uh, in a place in England called St Albans at the Decorum and Chilton Potters Group. So we have quite a lot of those groups in England, scattered sort of all over the country. So I'll very often go and do one of those for them. So that those people that know me, that want to learn how to, you know, do the work can actually go to those, those demonstrations. Cool. So at the moment, I am not teaching. <laughs> okay. So... Nobody call you, um, <laughs> <laughs> except look out for your workshops because you might be putting on a workshop nearby. Well, it's more like a, a, a sort of talk. Mm -hmm. So you sort of do a talk demonstration, really. So um, I, I sort of talk about some of the, you know, I'll take my sketchbooks along and I take um, how I get inspired, how I work out what I'm going to do onto a vessel. And then I'll show them some of the techniques on a half built vessel. So they can sort of see how to do them at what stage you add slip to a pot or how you would um, paint onto some newspaper and use that like a, a carbon paper and, you know, using sort of stencil techniques. So I kind of go through that for about an hour with them as well. So they, they sort of go away going, oh, I'm going to try that, That'd which, yeah, you know, I've done my job if yeah, people yeah. go away thinking that. So. 
Yeah. Well, I think people are going to go away from listening to you speak today on our podcast. Uh, really excited about some of the work that you're doing. And I want to just say a big thank you for participating here today. Um, it's been wonderful uh, meeting you and learning more about your work and how you think and how you let your spirit out. So that's, uh, that's <laughs> pretty cool. So thank you, Bob. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And good luck with the rest of your podcasts. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Color and Ceramics podcast with Bob Acton and his guests. Please help others find the podcast by subscribing to this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, such as iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, or other podcatchers. And don't forget to give us a review. We'll see you next time.